there are three main types of error that you're going to come across as a programmer. One of them is the so-called syntax error. This means breaking the rules of the language. For example, you might misspell a command, or forget to terminate a string with a double quote, or use an if without an end if. Syntax errors are sometimes referred to as compiler errors, and with Visual Studio, they'll be highlighted and you'll have to deal with them before you can even compile your code. The second type of error is the so-called runtime error, also known as an exception. An exception will cause your program to crash. That's what I'm going to talk about in this video. The third type of error is the so-called logical error. Now these don't cause the program to crash, but your program will produce the wrong results. It will do the wrong thing. And the only way to track these down is by testing your program carefully and comparing the actual output with the output you're expecting. Handling potential errors and writing code that won't crash is an aspect of what's known as defensive programming. In this video, you'll see how to deal with exceptions using the try catch finally block. Before we do, let's look at some examples of runtime errors, that is, exceptions. I've got a simple form here, and I've placed three text boxes on it, one called txt number one, as you can see in the properties window, another called txt number two, and then a third text box called txt my age. And there's a button as well to run the code. I'm going to declare three variables to capture the input. And now I'm going to assign the contents of two of those text boxes to two of these variables. I'm going to divide x by y and put the result into z. And I'll output z. Let's see what happens. Eight divided by two is four. I'm not doing anything with my age yet. But what happens if number two is a zero? Eight divided by zero. This has resulted in an overflow exception. In VB, anything divided by zero results in infinity. So the number is too big to be assigned to this type of variable, hence the overflow. If I attempt to do integer division using a backslash instead of a forward slash, this will trigger a runtime error as well. In this case, a division by zero exception. Potentially, this could happen because we don't really know what the user might do. And I certainly don't want the user to see these error messages. Let's see another one. I'll behave myself with these numbers because I don't want to trigger an error here. And let's type in the number 60. That's working fine, but if I type in some text, I'm getting an invalid cast exception. When I type 60 into the text box, I am actually capturing a string, but vb.net will automatically convert that string into an integer if it can. This data type conversion is called casting. If the user tries to input something that can't be cast into an integer, the program will crash. In fact, if I run the program again, and I don't type anything at all, I'm getting an invalid cast exception on every one of these text boxes, because what I'm trying to input is a zero length string, as it says here. Conversion from the string, a pair of empty quotes, to type integer is not valid. With so much potential for this type of error, there's no way I'd want to give this program to a user. Let's see a couple more exceptions. I'll comment out this code for now. I'm assigning the text Kevin to a string variable called my name, and then I'm converting it to uppercase using the to upper method. This will work fine. There's my name in uppercase. But if I don't assign a value to this variable, 
the two upper method has got nothing to work with. Now I might try and do this, but I'm getting a syntax error. I can't just have the name of a variable floating around in my code. I have to do something with it. So let me try this instead. I'm saying if 1 equals 2, I'll assign the value to my name. Of course, 1 does not equal 2, so Kevin will never be assigned to my name. But I'm still trying to call the to upper method. In fact, I'm getting a little compiler warning here telling me that I haven't actually assigned a value to this variable, and it might cause a runtime exception. Let's see. This time, I'm getting a null reference exception. And here's another exception which you're likely to come across if you're working with array variables. Now, if I try to do this, my program is going to crash. Index out of range exception. Index was outside the bounds of the array. You should have expected this. I'm trying to assign a value to an element of the array that doesn't exist. If you're using looping constructs to iterate through an array, there's a strong possibility you'll come across this. So, how do we deal with errors like this? Let's get rid of some of this code so we can see more clearly what's going on. I'm going to put each line of code that might crash my program into a try-catch block. I think I'll leave the array variable out of this. Watch what happens. Number one must be a number. Number two must be a number. My age must be a number. Number two must be bigger than zero. When a runtime error is triggered by the code within the try section of the try catch block, it's handled by the code in the catch section. I've replaced the built-in error message with my own. Thinking about it, my error message should give a little bit more guidance to the user. Number one is required and must be a number, because remember, if I don't type something in the text box, it's still a zero-length string. Inside the catch block, Instead of just displaying a message, I could take other appropriate action. For example, I could assign a default value to a variable if I'm unable to capture it from the user. Exactly what I do in the catch block depends on what code comes after all of the input has been collected. What matters most here is that my program should not be allowed to crash. And, if I've set the appropriate default values, it can continue. If I want, I can use the text of the built-in error message, like this. EX is the exception, and it has a message property which I can display. When you get into object-oriented programming, this syntax will make more sense. For now, watch what happens. That's the error message I would have seen if there had been a runtime error. But I've trapped it, and I'm just borrowing the text of the message. To be honest, I think my message was friendlier. You could put all of your code inside just one try-catch block like this.
This generic message is not particularly user-friendly, but arguably it's better than no exception handling at all. Having said that, this approach might not be appropriate depending on what your program actually does and whether or not other programs depend on its output. A single try block can also have multiple catch clauses, and each one can handle a specific type of exception, like this. If you take this approach, you need to bear in mind that if an exception is handled, for example if the code in the first catch block executes, none of the code in the other catch blocks will execute. This is rather like an if statement with multiple else if clauses. That's the first exception being handled, and then we drop out of the try catch block altogether. Notice the value of z is zero. When I input different data, well, <laughs> I'm still getting my division by zero exception, because I haven't handled that one. I haven't anticipated all of the possible exceptions. Let's make this a regular division operation instead. That's the second catch block executing, handling the overflow exception, which I did anticipate. And this time, notice that the value of z is 1, because I assigned a value to it within the catch block. Now you should have noticed that these two lines of code are going to execute no matter what. If there's an exception and it's handled, the flow of control will move to the code below the end try, and they'll execute. If there's no exception to handle, they're going to execute anyway. I could put these two lines of code inside a finally section, like this. Any code which I put inside the finally section will execute, no matter what. Now you might be wondering, why do we need a finally clause at all? Why not just put the code outside of the try block? Well, it's really just a way of showing that these lines of code are related in some way to the code inside the try block. If they were not in the finally section, you could suppose that they were doing something completely unrelated. Typically, the finally section is used for cleanup code. For example, if the code inside the try block opens an external file or connects to an external database, you're going to want to close these files or these database connections no matter what. The finally section will give your code a logical structure and ultimately make it easier to maintain. To finish off, let me give you one more piece of advice. It's good practice to try to anticipate possible problems at runtime that might cause your programs to crash and you should write code that doesn't rely on exception handling, if at all possible. For example, you can check that a text box isn't empty with an if statement before attempting to assign its value to a variable. You can also use an if statement with the isNumeric function to check if it's actually possible to convert a value into a number before attempting to cast it. Try catch blocks require additional processing and might make your programs less efficient than they otherwise would have been. Exception handling does have a place when it comes to defensive programming, but it is for exceptional circumstances. Exception handling shouldn't be used as a substitute for thorough input validation. <laughs>